Hello, my name is Julie Sogstead, and today I will be providing lecture 4.3 on extracellular RNA PCR. The broad outline for today's lecture will be the building blocks of DNA, the polymerase chain reaction, reverse transcriptase, quantitative PCR, and applications of PCR. The human genome is comprised of over 3 billion DNA base pairs. The DNA bases include the purines, adenine and guanine, and the pyrimidines, cytosine and thymine. The nucleotides which form the DNA helix are made of a base, a pentose sugar, which is a deoxyribose in DNA, and that's depicted by the carbon two hydrogen, and a phosphate group. And together, these three make a nucleotide. The formed nucleotides now move forward to make a double-stranded DNA. This is done by the pairing of the nucleotides inside of the DNA helix, so adenine binds to thymine and cytosine binds to guanine. And then the backbone of this is actually that a phosphate group links a C5 deoxyribose to a C3 deoxyribose. So that means you have a free 5 prime phosphate at one end of the DNA strand and a free 3 prime phosphate at the other end of the strand. That's why DNA is actually read as 5 prime to 3 prime. Now that we've been reminded what a DNA strand is, we'll talk about the polymerase chain reaction. There are three basic steps to PCR. The first one is denaturation. And this is when you have the separation of two hydrogen bonded complementary chains of DNA into a pair of single stranded polynucleotide molecules. This occurs by the process of heating. So in a PCR reaction, the first thing you do is to denature your DNA at 94 to 96 degrees. The second step in the PCR reaction is annealing. This is when we take primers that are complementary to the DNA and they're added to the reaction and the temperature is lowered. Now the primers can anneal and form base pairs with the single strand of DNA that they're complementary to. The temperature is lowered to about 45 to 60 degrees, depending on the makeup of your primers. The third and final step in PCR is extension. When DNA polymerase binds to the primer template DNA and then incorporates new nucleotides that are complementary to the template DNA, and this will synthesize two copies of the template DNA. This is typically done at 72 degrees, which is optimal for the extension by the DNA polymerases. Here we see that each PCR cycle leads to a doubling of DNA. The template DNA is exponentially amplified over a series of several PCR cycles. There are six ingredients that are needed for a polymerase chain reaction. You need template DNA, primers, a DNA polymerase, the four nucleotides, magnesium ion, and a thermal cycler. The first ingredient is template DNA. This can be any DNA, whether it's genomic, complementary, or plasma DNA. The DNA complexity actually contributes to deciding the optimal input amount. For example, here you need 0.1 to 1 nanogram of plasma DNA, which is sufficient to amplify by PCR, but you need may need 5 to 50 nanograms of genomic DNA to amplify in PCR. Here you can see that if you use 50 nanograms of plasma DNA, you get a much higher amount of PCR product versus 50 nanograms of genomic DNA. The optimization of DNA amount is important also because if you use higher amounts, you increase the risk of nonspecific amplification in the reaction, and if you use too low amounts, it could reduce the yield. The second ingredient in the PCR reaction is the primers. These are typically 15 to 30 base oligos that are designed to bind sequences, flanking the region of interest in the template DNA. The melting temperatures, also known as TM, are best at 55 to 70 degrees centigrade, and the TM of the two primers should be within five degrees of each other to allow them each to bind to the template DNA at the same temperature. The GC content of the primer should be 40 to 60%. It's helpful to have one CRG at the three prime end, and this promotes primer anchoring and enables extension. But if you have more than three Gs or Cs at the end, it may cause nonspecific priming. You can also have complementarity between primers that could promote primer dimers or self priming of the secondary structures. Evidence of that is seen in the DNA blot at the bottom of the slide, where we see as higher primer concentrations are incorporated, you start to see nonspecific product and or primer dimers. 
There are a number of sites that can help you find your best primer for your PCR reaction. The one I've listed is for NIH through the NCBI, a tool called Primer Blast. It's very helpful in developing primers. The third ingredient needed for PCR is DNA polymerase. A bit of history here, a microbiologist by the name of Thomas Brock first discovered a heat-resistant bacteria in the Lower Geyser Basin in Yellowstone Park in 1966. The first and best-known thermostable DNA polymerase, TAC, was isolated from a heat-resistant bacteria, Thermus aquaticus, in 1976, and it was shown that it could survive in near-boiling water. The discovery that TAC could be used in PCR eliminated the need to add new polymerase after every cycle of thermal denaturation. And in 1989, science named TAC polymerase as its first molecule of the year. There are four characteristics to DNA polymerase. One of these is specificity. We know that polymerases can extend misprime targets and primer dimers, and this can lead to nonspecific amplifications and compromised results of your PCR experiment. Typically, PCR is set up on ice to keep the DNA polymerase activity low and to reduce nonspecific amplification of products. There's also a technique termed hot start where antibodies to TAC are used to inhibit its activity at room temperature. This allows the reactions to be set up at room temperature without nonspecific amplifications and primer dimer formation. Then when the PCR is placed at the high temperature denaturation step, this will degrade the antibodies, which are proteins, and this leads to activation of the polymerase. Another characteristic of DNA polymerase is fidelity. Polymerases have a proofreading capability, and this occurs via a three prime to five prime exonuclease activity that they can do. When a mismatched nucleotide is incorporated at the polymerization domain, DNA synthesis will stall, and this allows excision of the mismatched nucleotide and replacement with the correct nucleotide. Fidelity is now expressed relative to TAC. The fidelity of a naturally occurring proofreading polymerase, such as PFU or KOD, is around 10x TAC, and the fidelity of next generation engineered polymerases is 50 to 300 times TAC. Another characteristic of DNA polymerase is its thermal stability. TAC can withstand high temperatures, but the half-life of TAC shortens at greater than 90 degrees C, and long templates may need to have TAC replenished during the procedure. However, polymerases from hypothermophilic organisms now have higher thermostability. An example is PFU polymerase that's isolated from the Chirococcus furiosus bacteria that's 20 times more stable than TAC at 95 degrees C. Other thermostable polymerases include KOD and GBD from Thermococcus and Pyrococcus species. The fourth characteristic of DNA polymerases is termed processivity, and this reflects the synthesis rate and speed of the polymerase as well as the affinity for the substrates. Highly processive DNA polymerases are beneficial for application of long templates, sequences with secondary structures and high GC content and in the presence of PCR inhibitors such as heparin, xylan, and humic acid, they're found in blood and plant tissues. The fourth ingredient in PCR are the deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates. The four DNTPs, A, C, G, and T, are added in equal amounts at a 0.2 millimolar final concentration for most applications. Exceeding the optimal concentrations of DNTPs actually can inhibit PCR, and if you're doing an experiment to introduce random mutagenesis, you use unbalanced DNTP concentrations, and this will promote higher misincorporation by a non-proofreading DNA polymerase. Higher concentrations of DNTPs, though, may be helpful for samples with high levels of magnesium, which bind to DNTPs and reduce their availability for incorporation. The fifth ingredient in the PCR is magnesium. This is a DNA polymerase cofactor, and it enables the corporation of DNTPs during the extension cycle. Magnesium will catalyze the formation of a phosphodiester bond between the three prime hydroxyl of a primer and the phosphate group of the DNTP. Magnesium also facilitates formation of DNA primer complexes 
and it will stabilize the negative charges on the phosphate backbones. The sixth ingredient for PCR is the thermocycler. This automates temperature cycling and PCR incubation times. The first thermocycler was introduced by Perkin Elmer and Cetus in 1985. Prior to this, PCR was laborious. A person had to transfer samples between water baths of different temperatures, and this required precise timing of each step. Between the thermocycler and the discovery of TAC DNA polymerase, PCR automation was made a reality. Just a bit of PCR history. Dr. Kerry Mullis was awarded the 1993 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his invention of the PCR technique. This invention became a sexual technique in biochemistry and molecular biology, and it was described by the New York Times as highly original and significant, virtually dividing biology into the two epochs, before PCR and after PCR. Thus far, I've talked about the building blocks of DNA and the polymerase chain reaction itself. That's all about amplifying DNA. But what if you want to measure RNAs? We know that there are messenger RNAs encoded in the transcriptome, and many people are interested in looking at changes in their expression and their levels to see if they may go up or down with certain treatments. We also know that there are a number of non-coding RNAs now that are very important. These include microRNAs that are known to regulate the translation of a mRNA into a protein by binding to the 3' UTR. There's also a number of other non-coding RNAs that we're learning more and more about and the ability to amplify those and look at whether their expression is changing in a treatment or a diagnostic group is quite exciting. The ability to amplify RNA by PCR was made because of the discovery of reverse transcriptase. RT was discovered by Howard Tetman and David Baltimore in 1970. They shared the 1975 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery of RT. They showed the occurrence of a specific enzyme, RT, in RNA tumor virus particles, and the RT could make a DNA copy from RNA. It's interesting that within a decade, in the early 80s, HTLV-1 and 2 retroviruses were discovered and found to cause leukemia, and then in 1983, HIV was isolated and identified as the causative agent of AIDS. Thus, scientists started making drugs that inhibit RT, such as AZT, which was developed as the first FDA-approved treatment available to people living with HIV and prolonged the lives of AIDS patients. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme used by certain viruses, such as HIV and hepatitis B, to replicate their genomes. It's also used by retrotransposon mobile genetic elements to proliferate within the genome, and it's used by eukaryotic cells to extend telomeres at the ends of their linear chromosomes. To the right is an image showing the structure of HIV RT. There are two subunits, P51 and P66, and there's an RNA dependent DNA polymerase site and a ribonuclease H site. The discovery of RT revolutionized molecular biology, enabled scientists to develop new research tools that heavily influenced cloning, analysis of gene expression, and in particular, RNA biology. Reverse transcriptase has three key enzyme activities. The first is an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase that uses a single strand of RNA template and a primer, such as a tRNA lysine for HIVRT to synthesize a DNA copy. This remains hybridized to the original RNA template. The next activity is that an RNA H endonuclease will selectively degrade the RNA in the DNA RNA hybrid, and then a DNA dependent DNA polymerase will convert a single stranded DNA into a double stranded DNA. This is a mechanism that RNA viruses use to take their genetic information and convert it into a double-stranded DNA that then gets incorporated into the genome of the host. RTs for molecular biology use two of these activities. The first is a recombinant RNA-DNA-dependent polymerase to convert RNA into a complementary DNA and producing this DNA-RNA hybrid. The second is the endoribonuclease activity that will specifically degrade the RNA complex to the DNA. And this leaves a single-stranded complementary DNA, cDNA, that is used for PCR. Reverse transcriptase PCR is a process where RNA is converted to complementary DNA that is then amplified by a polymerase chain reaction. The example here is of a memRNA. The RNA starts with an AUG codon and it typically ends with a polyadenylation tail.
we add an oligo DT primer that's complementary to and binds the polyne tail. And then with the added reverse transcriptase and DNTPs, the RT can bind to the oligo DT primer complex and it starts to synthesize complementary DNA by adding the deoxynucleotide triphosphates. So at the end of this process, you have a first strand cDNA synthesis. And next, the RNA is degraded, leaving you with a complementary DNA or a cDNA. And this product can then be amplified with specific primers and attack in the PCR reaction. For the amplification of small RNAs, you basically use the same concept. For example, you can have a mature microRNA and we use a poly A polymerase to add polyadenylation to the three prime end of the microRNA sequence. Then we anneal oligo DT adapters and do the RT reaction. That results in a complementary DNA, a cDNA, that's now ready for PCR, and you can use that in the PCR assay. Another method to reverse transcribe small RNAs, such as microRNAs, involves the use of a stem loop RT primer. The microRNA attaches to a stem loop RT primer, and then the complex undergoes reverse transcription to produce the first strand cDNA. That complex is now used for the PCR reaction by adding a forward primer that has complementarity to the five prime end of the mature RNA, and then by using a universal reverse primer to amplify the DNA. One method of PCR that we use a lot is called quantitative PCR. It's used for both qualitative and quantitative applications, including gene expression analysis, in our case, microRNA analysis for the identification of biomarkers, also to look at single nucleotide polymorphisms and genotyping and copy number variation. During the qPCR, data is collected throughout the PCR in real time, and this enables true quantification of DNA, or in our case, RNA. It combines PCR amplification and detection into a single step because fluorescent dyes label the products during the thermal cycling. So you measure the accumulation of fluorescent signal during the exponential phase of the reaction. What results is the higher the starting copy number of the target, the sooner an increase in the fluorescence is observed. There are two chemistries used in quantitative PCR to measure new templates. First of these is cyber green, where a green fluorescent dye is incorporated into the reaction. During the extension cycle, the green dye is incorporated into the new DNA template strands, and that incorporation is measured by the PCR reaction. The second chemistry that is used in quantitative PCR is TACMAN, where a TACMAN probe is attached to the DNA in the reaction. The probe consists of a fluorophore on one end and a quencher on the other end, such that the fluorophore is in close contact and you won't see any fluorescence from that product. However, as you make a new DNA strand during the amplification assay, this probe is displaced and it cleaves the tacmine probe into two pieces. Now you have the free fluorophore that's able to fluoresce and the quencher falls off. On the right side, you can see the differences between cyber green and tacman. In cyber green, you're actually incorporating a fluorescent dye into the new template, whereas in tacman, you're taking a probe that was attached to the DNA and now chomping it away to be free and fluorescent picked up by the quantitative PCR instrument. Comparing the features of TACMAN and cyber green chemistry, we can see that there are differences in their specificity, their applications, their reproducibility, et cetera. We typically for EXRNA and RNA PCR use the TACMAN based detection. You get higher specificity, more copies, it's highly reproducible, higher levels of quantification, and just a better outcome in the PCR reaction. Today, I've discussed the basics of the polymerase chain reaction, and then we talked about reverse transcriptase, which allowed RNAs to be amplified into a complementary DNA and then undergo PCR, and then specifically the quantitative PCR reaction, which we use a lot for the detection of small RNAs, extracellular RNAs, in particular in biofluids and as biomarkers for disease. This slide depicts a number of PCR variations that have been developed. There's no limit really uh, to different methodologies and different approaches to doing PCR. Finally, let's talk about the applications of PCR. Here we can see that PCR is used for environmental microbiology, genetic research, medicine, forensic science, food and agriculture, 
And in our current history, we used RT-QPCR to detect the SARS-CoV-2 virus. My question really is to everybody, what is QPCR not used for? In summary, today we've talked about the three steps of PCR, denaturing, annealing, and extension, the six different PCR ingredients, template, DNA primers, DNA polymerase, the nucleotides, magnesium, and a thermocycler. We discussed a bit of history about Carrie Mullis, who was awarded the Nelpar Prize for PCR, but many of the PCR ingredients were also discovered by earlier scientists, such as the microbiologist that discovered TAC. Reverse transcription PCR uses RNA rather than DNA as the starting template. The reason we could do this is that Temin and Baltimore discovered reverse transcriptase and they won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Reverse transcriptase is an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase that converts RNA into complementary DNA, a single-stranded DNA. Cypergreen can incorporate fluorescent dye into a PCR product as it accumulates, while TACMAN actually displaces a fluorogenic probe specific to the target, and you can detect that fluorogen as it accumulates. qPCR actually measures the amount of a target or can compare relative amounts of targets between samples. There are PCR platforms now that can simplify assays for high throughput, and these are continually being developed. PCR applications include basic molecular biology studies, medical and diagnostic applications, forensic applications, and infectious disease applications, such as the detection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. At the end here, I've given you a link to the entertaining PCR song that if you have any extra time, you might find it a bit enjoyable. Thank you.